you've just returned uh, from Hong Kong from your spring sales uh, there. Um, we're here to discuss the future of the consumer, but has the future already arrived for you? One sale in Hong Kong was described as populated by millennials in hoodies dropping millions of dollars on street art. And they were, uh, yes. Uh, well, our Hong Kong sales aren't quite finished yet, but thus far, very good things are happening. We've hammered down 324 million U.S. dollars last night against a forecast for the entire series of 300 million. We broke wine sale records. We broke sale records on multiple occasions. It's, things look very good over there to us. Um, and this focus on millennials, how much are you or how aggressively are you going after this demographic? Dramatically. Um, a great deal of what we've been doing over the past few years is to make it really, really easy to do business with us using digital technologies. And that really works well for millennials. Uh, similarly, we're also making progress on making it easy to sell things through us using digital technologies. Again, works well with millennials. Uh, millennials, though, have often been accused of being more interested in the experience than actually owning things. Are they less acquisitive than previous generations? Well, one of the great things about Sotheby's is buying something with us can be a really fun experience. <laughs> so you get both in one. Um, you mentioned their uh, online uh, auctions and using digital technologies. You've talked more about incorporating broader tech as well, including AI. How's that going to grow your business? Um, well, AI can help in numerous areas. One is it can help suggest things that you may not know that you want. Uh, number two, it can help us prioritize which things are most important for us to focus on internally and help us save costs. Uh, and number three, it can help us get a sort of external benchmark on figuring out what things are worth. You have secured a Rothko among a number of other high-profile works for, your, for, up May, for sure. your upcoming spring sales in May, but you took it to Asia first. We Is did. that the future of your customer base? Uh, yes, and uh, y yes, of course, because it's so large. The only reason I'm hesitating slightly is because I look at other pockets of emerging wealth, such as California, parts of the United States, uh, parts of Europe, wherever you see wealth being created substantially and ultra-high net worths multiplying, that's where you're going to see our business grow and thrive. So it's not necessarily country-specific. It can be region-specific. It can be region-specific. It can be, again, wherever ultra-high net worths are being um, created, wealth being created, that's a good place for Sotheby's. Now, geopolitics puts some pressure on ultra-high net worth individuals, especially when you look at sanctions on individuals in Russia, capital controls in China. That must pressure uh, your customer in particular. How does that pressure the business? Well, the great thing about what's been going on in the economy over the last sort of 20 years is so much wealth is being created that uh, while some might uh, have issues in certain areas, uh, there's new pockets of wealth being created. We just need to make it, find them and make it really easy for them to transact with us. And so you have to be very nimble then as you we sort of try and move and around. <laughs> it's all about making it really easy to do business with us. Uh, well, let's talk about then uh, your sales. You saw double-digit sales growth in the last quarter. Sotheby's share price, though, has been sort of going in the other direction. Why have investors lost confidence? Well, I actually don't know that they have. I think a lot of it is um, uh, t uh, two or three things related to views on leveraged emerging markets. Um, but our view is this. Uh, we continue to put up really great results, and we continue to do things we're doing, and good things will follow for the investors. Are they a little bit concerned about margin pressure, perhaps? Um, I'm not sure uh, whether they're concerned about margin pressure. Um, it's uh, interesting to see that the stock price began to fall when there was some equity market softness last uh, um, sort of summer in China. Um, but um, it's hard to tell. Uh, last year, you said you expected 2019 uh, to be softer or a little bit weaker than 2017, 2018. Yeah. Is that still the case? Is that what you're seeing? Yeah. The, what you're referring to is the November earnings call, I said, a bit more subdued. And the crucial aspect of that is then it was at the beginning of 2018. As you recall, going into 2018, all we had only tailwinds. As you look at 2019 relative to a year ago, it was a bit more subdued because that was fantastic. What we have here is still pretty good. Uh, well, so what are the headwinds, though, then? What are the things that concern you most, perhaps, about the macro environment? Actually, I'm not, I'm not particularly concerned about the macro environment. Um, I, I mean, there are things that are out there. Brexit is out there. Uh, interest rates are out there. Um, uh, trade noise is out there. But all of those are baked into expectations right now. We're still seeing very good things coming out of our sales. And so you expect to weather uh, those headwinds? Uh, through this year? Well, w w at the moment, what we see is good. Um, but the, one of the, uh, you know, we, we can't know what we don't know yet. So we'll see. But we feel pretty good about things as they stand now.